Hey guys, Jason here from Off The Beaten Path and back home after what's been a pretty epic two weeks. Thought I'd make this quick video just to uh, update you all on what happened uh, and how the variety trip uh, didn't go the way as planned. So let me uh, try and do that. There's going to be a lot of videos to come out of this trip, but um, for those of you who follow me on, follow off the beaten path on Facebook, um, you've got an idea of some of the things that uh, that happened. Um, but let's let's get into it. So the trip officially started here in Mildura um, on Sunday two weeks ago. Um, and we weren't able to follow the routes that were planned for the trip, um, largely due to weather. Um, a lot of the tracks were very soft. Uh, so the route was up the bitumen um, and we stopped partway between Mildura and Broken Hill. So we went up the Silver City Highway uh, for a lunch stop. Um, at that time, we negotiated with some of the trip organizers to take a detour and head over and see Menindi Lakes. Um, we took the back way, uh, which was um, which was good. Our first actual bit of four wheel driving, and it took much longer than anticipated. A lot of these tracks that the maps sort of show here don't actually connect through, so hence the reason for our meandering route there to find a way through. We got to Menindi Lakes, it was pretty late in the day, we didn't get to spend much time there, definitely an area I'd like to go back to and spend some more time. Um, and from there we jumped on the bitumen, headed back to Broken Hill and on to Silverton, which was our destination for the first day of the trip. It was about 6.30pm by the time we got to Silverton. And from there, now that's just me opening my track notes so that I uh, don't forget to mention something. Um, so we got to Silverton about 6.30 p.m. and had dinner and then we had to set up camp because it was a camping night that night. Uh, so it was in the dark and in the rain that we're setting up camp and talk about initiation by fire. We had... Uh, pretty heavy rain and winds um, at sort of 35 to 40 kilometers an hour gusting up to 60 kilometers an hour that night um, so that was pretty full on um, I discovered that uh, my Coleman tent that I've been using for a few years uh, in winds of that uh, that strength definitely needs to all the, all the anchors down I woke up part way through the night with one of the arms having collapsed and rain coming in on my face so you know things you learn um but we got through that night packed up in the morning still in the rain and um found out that yeah we definitely weren't heading on the four-wheel drive tracks that were planned um partially due to a movie being filmed out that way and partially due to or probably more more so due to the fact that um, the tracks were just um, not not in good condition due to the amount of rain that uh, has been falling the last few weeks. So again, the day two route was up the bitumen and we headed to a place called Pack Saddle, great little roadhouse there, and that's where we had lunch. And then we headed north again, still on the bitumen, uh, and just before getting into Tipperborough, <coughs> we uh, turned left to head to Cameron's Corner. Um, you can get fuel at Pack Saddle and you can get fuel at Tipperborough as well. Uh, the road from the Tipperborough turnoff to Cameron Corner was um, not bitumen at least, uh, so we did drop some pressure out of the tyres. Uh, so apart from our side trip, that was our first time dropping some, some air out of the tyres and um, it was quite an enjoyable ride uh, drive through there um, it was um, quite a wide graded ro gravel road some um, some corrugations as you might expect and um, also um, quite a few dunes um, not super big dunes but that was really our our first taste of desert driving and and driving over dunes and we got to Cameron Corner about uh, 5 30 
and um, were able to set up camp there um, in the light, uh, which was which was good. Um, and the guys running the corner store there at Cameron Corner looked after us uh, for a great meal and some great hospitality. And we did get a little bit of rain and some high winds, but having set up camp during the day, we were much better placed. And I should mention too, actually, the the morning uh, we that morning when we departed Silverton, we we were advised that we may not be able to get to Birdsville um, due to weather conditions, and that we should do some shopping in Broken Hill. So we did do that that morning as well. Um, so yeah, we stayed the night at Cameron Corner, and then from there we headed on the Streslecki up to Enaminka. And um, again, that was quite a good drive. We drove parts of the old Streslecki track, which was a little more challenging than the, the new Streslecki. Uh, certainly had some soft parts. Um, and just before we got all the way into Inaminka, we um, took a turn onto Adventure Way, went up to visit the site of the Dig Tree, which is uh, just here. Uh, so that's that little little detour just there. And, um, and then we took uh, the dig tree circuit route back in, uh, which brought us into Inaminka from the north, and we crossed the um, causeway of the Cooper Creek, which apparently doesn't always flow, but was flowing really well while we were there. And we stayed that night at Inaminka. That was pre-booked, and we are staying in a cabin there. Um, again, the guys running the Inamika Hotel looked after us really well. The food was great, uh, and really good hospitality, and just great people. Really good place to visit. Lots of history. So for those that don't know, the Dig Tree um, is significant in the journey of Burke and Wills, uh, and Burke and Wills grave sites are also quite close to Inamika. So that night at Inaminka, we were advised we'd be staying another night at Inaminka because the Diamantina River, which is just east of Birdsville, was actually flooded and there was no way we could get over. The police were not allowing anyone to cross. Um, there was also some questions about uh, road conditions and whether roads would be open. So that was something that I certainly learned that uh, even some of the major roads can be hugely affected by weather and road conditions and whether they're open or closed becomes a pretty popular topic of conversation uh, in these remote areas. And uh, everybody uh, wants to know what's going on with the road situation, particularly those that are choosing to try and tow vans on, on some of these remote roads. So we, we, uh, we, we knew that night we were staying an extra day in Inaminka and the little bit of red you can see on the map there because I've marked our actual trip journey in here. We went out and scouted some of the campsites and look in terms of camping, the accommodation in Inaminka was great but the camping would be awesome. Um, along the Cooper Creek there's a myriad of really good campsites. Um, most so, There's probably some free campsites, most of them are 10 bucks a night. Uh, and you can get right down next to the water there as well, certainly when it's flowing like it was when we were there. Uh, we also took the opportunity to visit Burke and Will's grave sites, and we visited uh, the um, Catamala water holes as well. Kalimara water holes, I should say, uh, which is part of the Cooper Creek uh, system, uh, and generally had a, had a good day looking around in Aminka. That night, is when we're advised um, by the guys running the variety trip that um, still the um, Diamantina River hadn't come down and wasn't looking like coming down anytime soon and in fact there was more water on the way from the rain in southeast Queensland and, and the rest of Queensland for that matter so if you've been following the weather in Queensland at all uh, you're probably aware that they've had three or four weeks of pretty solid rain and that was affecting this whole northern area of South Australia and parts of the Territory as well um, quite a lot um, because of the linkages with those river systems. So it was that night that we were advised that the trip would continue on. Um, and keeping in mind, look, the guys running the trip, they, they, they have to make decisions around catering for 
60 to 80 people and a myriad of different vehicles. Um, so look, they, they really didn't have a lot of choices and a lot of options on what they could do. Um, and they uh, wanted to keep the trip running as best they could. So they selected a route through Windora to Longreach via Winton and Biloela into the NT to get onto the highway north of Alice Springs and then come back to Alice Springs and complete the latter part of the trip as planned, unfortunately missing out on the Simpson. Um, so, look, we had uh, some long talks in our vehicle about what we were going to do, and uh, also chatted to some of the other trip participants, and we were, you know, for us, a big part of this trip. Much as we were there to support Variety and what they do and the great work that they do, uh, a big part of this trip for us was the Simpson. And um, the Streslecki was, um, parts of it were closed um, on that day, but we decided that if it was open the next morning, that we would perhaps um, depart the Variety trip, the, the official trip, um, because it was going to be 2,000 k's of driving on bitumen. And we would uh, we would head south, try and get around to Mount Dare from the south, and look at trying to do the Simpson from west to east instead of east to west. So the next morning, that's what we did. We spoke to the trip organisers and advised them of our intentions, and we departed the official variety trip. And we headed south um, back down the Streslecki. Um, we we did sort of poke our nose in. Um, we thought about doing the top end of the Flinders Ranges, but um, it was pretty soon apparent that that track was was not going to be passable. It was very wet, very soft. Uh, so we continued on this Streslecki to Lindhurst, where we refueled, um, then turned north, called in at Farina, which is a, a fascinating little town it's actually an abandoned town it's on the alignment of the old garn railway so we're, we're down here now um, there's a lot of abandoned stone buildings there and um, there's a cafe that's run by volunteers during the the tourist season uh, and also an underground oven well worth checking out and we continued on that night to Maree and it was looking like rain so we booked into the local caravan park at Maree and stayed in the cabin there and had quite a good uh, quite a good meal that night at the local pub um, the next morning was the first indication that maybe i was going to have some trouble on this trip with the pajero um, loaded up the car in the morning went to start the car battery was dead wouldn't start we were very, very fortunate that we found ourselves in a caravan park with lots of other people around and were able to get the vehicle jumper looted. So that was certainly, uh, certainly helpful. So after getting the vehicle jumper looted, we got started. We we're a little bit, a uh, little bit hesitant about what that meant. And um, we also found out that morning that north of Udnadatta, the Udnadatta track was shut, which meant we weren't going to be able to get through to Mount Dare without doing something illegal and driving on closed roads, which we didn't want to do. And we were a little bit suspect of what was exactly going on with the vehicle anyway. So what we decided to do was drive north on the Udnadatta track as far as the viewing area of Lake Eyre, uh, it was pretty amazing to actually see Lake Eyre in flood, um, so that was cool. Uh, did turn the car off there, there was a number of people at the viewing area, so that was the first time after it not starting that morning we turned the car off. It started again fine, so that was a little bit reassuring. And then from there we decided to head south, uh, so we headed south down through Roxby Downs and Woomera. Um, there was a few... Um, nice stopping scenic points there so um, w was quite a good drive and then we headed all the way down to Port Augusta where um, again due to weather we decided to book into accommodation and stay the night. So the next morning we went to the Wadlata Information Centre in Port Augusta which is a great 
um, information center. They have lots of maps and info and picked up some information on the Flinders Ranges. Um, also found out that within the Flinders Ranges there's public tracks and then there's a lot of private owned stations that actually have four wheel drive tracks on them that you can access for a fee booking through various information centers or sometimes booking direct with those stations. So we headed northeast out of Port Augusta and we went to a little town called Quorn. Quorn or Corn, I'm not 100% sure how you pronounce that, it starts with a Q. And went to the information center there and we booked to do Warren Gorge, Arden Hills four wheel drive track. Um, there will be a video on that track. Um, it was rated as one of the more difficult tracks for the area and it was awesome. Uh, it was certainly as difficult and technical as um, just about anything I've driven in the Vic High Country. Uh, amazing views um, and looks so worth it. Um, as I'll cover off in the video, the fee for that was $60. Um, personally, I think that's well worth it. For those of you that drive in the High Country and surrounding areas regularly, you'll all be familiar with uh, landowners locking gates uh, due to the behavior of the minority that don't do the right thing and so the landowners do what they need to do to protect their stock and their property. Um, this system that they're running in the Flinders Ranges to me is a is a, is a really good win-win outcome for, for both groups. Uh, as a four-wheel driver you can book, you provide your name and your vehicle registration details and you pay a fee and they provide you with the gate key. They've also got a record of who is actually going onto the property so if you do the wrong thing they can track you down and, and address that with you. Uh, so yeah, we went and did Warren Gorge, Arden Hills, and then headed north after dropping the key back to Corn. Um, headed north via Hawker. Um, there's a great little uh, cafe there at Hawker, well worth checking out. They do really good coffee. And up into the Flinders Ranges, where we camped at um, the campsite there. From memory, I think that was the Trezona campground, which is sort of around about there. Uh, so we arrived in the dark, managed to actually find our booked campsite that we'd booked that morning in Port Augusta, set up the tents. A um, little bit of rain, a little bit of wind, but not nearly as bad as what we'd experienced earlier in the trip. And uh, had, a, had a great campfire and generally had a really good camp um, in the morning. Our plan was to actually stay two nights in the Flinders Ranges. So in the morning, we just loaded the essentials back into the car, started the car up, and we're getting ready to spend a day touring in the ranges and visiting some of the uh, some of the scenic sites. Unfortunately, that was not to be. So as soon as I started the car, battery light came on, number of other lights on the dash came on, and at this point, I was assuming that the the issue was most likely uh, a flat or failing battery so i thought that because the um the car hadn't started a couple of days earlier in marie and also when uh, i was getting some uh, some work done on the car at my mechanics prior to this trip um, they had the car for several days waiting for parts and things and they did inadvertently fully discharge the battery so Putting all that together, to me, I thought it's probably the battery, and I thought the solution would be just to get a new battery. So there's a couple of little villages um, within the Flinders Ranges, and I thought we might get lucky. Even though it was a Sunday, I was probably pretty optimistic there. So we headed up to Blinman and then across to the Angora China village to see if we could get a battery. Um, that's a was pretty apparent that that wasn't going to happen. There wasn't much in the way of mechanical services at either of those places. Certainly fuel, um, but not a lot else, and certainly not much on a Sunday. The fuel station at Angora China Village was actually only open from 1pm to 3pm on that day. So we looped around past um, Parachina the, on the main highway there, back into the campsite, picked up our tents and the rest of our camping gear, and headed south via the Bunaroo Gorge scenic drive back to Hawker. There's quite a well-equipped um, service station in Hawker. They carry a few spares. 
um, common things like tires and filters and uh, and batteries uh, but they didn't actually have the exact battery that we needed for the Pajero so carried on and actually drove back to Port Augusta as the guys at Hawker sort of said that's the nearest uh, opportunity we're going to have also by this point I'd been able to chat to my auto elect back home and he was suggesting that it was actually probably the alternator rather than the battery given the lights and other symptoms that were coming on. I had the uh, entertainment head unit going on and off. The gauges on the main instrument cluster were going on and off as well. Um, so yeah, there was something going on with the electrical system for sure. So we headed back to Port Augusta, booked back into the same accommodation we'd stayed a couple of nights earlier and planned to hit up an auto elect in the morning and that's exactly what we did so the next morning being monday we headed into an auto electrician in port augusta and described what was going on with the vehicle they agreed that it was most likely the alternator and suggested they could have if we left the vehicle with them they could have a look at it later that day and if it was the alternator they would order one overnight from adelaide as neither them nor anyone else really would have a Pajero alternator in Port Augusta um, and, and they could be fixed the next day on the Tuesday. So I uh, talked about that with my passenger Mark and we decided that, well, if the parts are in Adelaide, uh, it probably makes sense for us to proceed to Adelaide. And, you know, in our mind, if the car started we could drive the, the whole stint to Adelaide in one trip. So as long as it started, we were going to be fine. So that's what we did. Jumped in the car on the Monday morning and drove down to Adelaide, got there about lunchtime, stopped to grab some lunch and started making phone calls to auto Alexa and mechanics uh, to see if we could get one who could look at it that day. Did find a workshop um, that was an RAA certified workshop and had good reviews who was able and willing to look at the car that day so we took it that afternoon and dropped it off for them to have a look at uh, and come back to us. We're also fortunate they were able to provide us with a loan car. Um, so while they were diagnosing the car actually headed over to offline campers in Adelaide and had a look at uh, some of their latest models. We'll be doing a review video on their Domino, so keep an eye out for that on the channel coming up. And um, while we were there, got the call. It's definitely the alternator. They've ordered one and they'll have it first thing in the morning and the car should be ready at 11.30 the next morning. So we went back to uh, our accommodation. We booked into um, just a caravan park there and we're staying in a cabin and uh, prepared for getting back on the road the next day so about 11 30 the next day we gave them a call to see how it was going they said it was around half an hour away so about quarter past 12 we went over to the workshop hoping to pick the car up grab some lunch and uh, and get going um, that wasn't to be. Um, we were sort of waiting there for quite some time and by around 2.30 the car still wasn't ready so we went and got lunch and came back about quarter past three and we're advised that uh, they'd fitted the alternator, it was working, it was charging the battery, the battery was fine. The only thing was they couldn't get the battery light to actually go off on the dash and they suspected that could be a broken wire or something and uh, you know we gave us the option of waiting until they could resolve that which you know we didn't know how long that might be or taking the car as it is and pushing on given that they told us the battery was fine the alternator was working fine and it was just a um, you know essentially almost a faulty light um, we said look you know let's get going we've only got a certain number of days to try and uh, try and have some fun and explore a bit so uh, we we headed off um, it was probably about uh, four o'clock by the time we jumped in the car and we decided just to get out of Adelaide if we could and we uh, made it to Murray Bridge where we booked into a caravan park and uh, and camped there uh, it was a great little caravan park right on the Murray River and uh, we were looking forward to uh, you know e exploring some some parts of uh, southern 
SA. So I guess you can see what's, uh, what's coming up there. So the next, next day, which was um, Wednesday now, we um, drove from Murray Bridge, headed east out through Lamaru towards Pinaru, heading to the Nagarkat National Park, um, which is the one of the desert parks on the Vic SA border, with a view to doing the actual border track. So for those that don't know, the, it's, a, it's a sand track, runs right on the Vic SA border, and um, there's a number of dunes there, there's some soft sand. Uh, it's probably one of the more iconic tracks in that particular area and so that was our plan started off really well um, we we're enjoying the trip had a lunch stop stopped at the trig point there along the track and not too long after stopping at the trig point the um, started getting some of the electrical symptoms that we had had earlier in the trip so we um, we were getting the head unit switching on and off the little information panel, which is the two-color LED um, panel above the main entertainment head unit, was switching on and off. The dash light, the dash instrumentation was going on and off. Started getting a number of lights back on the dash. Very similar to what we were getting in the Flinders Rangers, indicating that the alternator was not working. Um, so clearly we resolved, look, we need to get out off this track as soon as we can. And, um, and and get back to a workshop and get the car looked at. Unfortunately, as things panned out, we weren't going to get that opportunity. Probably less than a kilometre further along, the check engine light came on, the car went into limp mode, and then within a few hundred metres, completely shut down electrically. So literally, while we're driving, no, it just shut down. Engine stopped. All the lights went on the on the dash went off. Nothing was working. No interior lights, no headlights, no instrumentation lights, nothing. Just dead. So there we were on the border track about 20 to 30 k's from um, the nearest bitumen um, and broken down. So let me tell you, right at this point, I was pretty glad I had the Zolio with me. I was able to contact my wife, who was still back home in Albury, and through messaging her using the Zolio satellite communicator, was able to coordinate, um, ultimately, um, a recovery. So initially, she was talking to the track management guys and the rangers. Rangers were happy to come out the next morning. Uh, it was about 3.30 in the afternoon by this time, uh, and take us out, but they're not allowed to actually recover vehicles. Um, it's just part of their, their role that they can assist people, but not vehicles. And nobody was too much aware of anyone who might be able to help. We are able to get on to Will, or my wife was able to get on to Will from Border Town Towing, um, and he came out, uh, so he had a tow truck and a trusty D22 Navara, and uh, by the time he found his way to us, it was about 8.30 at night, and so it began. Um, it was a long, slow process. Uh, it was nearly, uh, it was about 34 k's from where we were broken down, 34 k's of sand uh, to get back to the actual um, campground where he'd left his truck, so you can see marked here. So that was the breakdown site. That was where he had to tow us back to here to get the Pajero on the tow truck. So by the time we got to there, it was about 2.30, and then it was about an hour to drive into Border Town. So we got into Border Town at about 3.30 in the morning. Just crazy. We, we, we couldn't book in anywhere at that time. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a small town. After hours check-in just wasn't a thing. Um, so Mark and I crashed at the uh, OTR and um, let Will go home to get some sleep and we we're going to figure out in the morning what we're going to do with the vehicle. So the next morning made some calls, um, had thought about going towards Horsham, um, Will had suggested maybe Narracourt, both of those places had Mitsubishi dealers. 
The Horsham and Mitsubishi dealer said it was going to be at least a, a month before they could look at the vehicle. Um, Narra Court said up to three weeks, but if I was to take it there and leave it there, they would try and look at it after the first week or so, um, just by having the vehicle there. And there was also an Avis rented car in Narra Court, so that seemed like a good option. Get the Pajero towed there to the Mitsubishi dealer, hire a car from Avis and drive home. As it seems with everything on this trip, it was not to be so simple. So we, um, we got Will to tow the car to the Mitsubishi dealer and he dropped me off at Avis Renter Cars <coughs> where I found out that in regional areas, even rental car businesses like Avis <coughs> are actually often franchises. And so the vehicles are privately owned by the people who own those businesses in those areas. They're not actually part of the, the national Avis fleet and what that means is, of course, the people that own those vehicles want them to stay in their area. They don't want them to go all over the countryside um, because they're an asset that they've spent money in, on and invested in. Uh, so there's limitations on how far and where you can take the vehicle. So um, I, that particular franchise was actually, their head office was Mount Gambia. Um, so we were able to negotiate to rent the one and only vehicle that was available, which was a Kia Rio, and drive it one way to Mount Gambia, which, for those of you that know your geography, is not actually towards Aubrey, but it's a larger town, and I thought we'd have some more options there. So we got to the, got to the mount, and look from there, made a few phone calls, um, ended up calling in some uh, some favours from family. Um, and we got back to Hamilton in Victoria and then um, my wife came and picked us up from Hamilton um, the next day so uh, back home now that that's the trip that's not the tr that's the trip we had it's not the trip we planned it's not the trip we wanted to have um, this is probably not a super exciting video but so much has happened on this trip I really felt like uh, it was worth making a video to sort of explain the trip um, and uh yeah um look if you've got any more questions post them down below guys um i will get uh get the regular series of trip videos up and running again um as soon as i get a chance to do some editing um lucky i've got a fair bit of content from this trip because there won't be too many more new trips um for the next few weeks that's for sure as always guys thanks for watching um thanks for your support and feedback on the videos um i hope you found this one a little bit interesting it's it's not a trip video per se but explains what's been going on for the last couple of weeks so have a great day see you in